thank you for tuning in to This Automation Life, brought to you by Brenner, Brenner Fiedler. I'm your host, Jeremy Schubert. Each week, we discuss technologies used in automation. This week, Ed Neff, president of SMAC, is here with Brenner Fiedler to discuss voice coil actuators. Thanks for joining us today, Ed. Thank you. So, Ed, when we talk about a voice coil actuator, I think that may be something a lot of people haven't heard of before. What is a voice coil actuator? Well, voice coils are um, those are the driving mechanisms for speakers. So uh, we started out, we called our, our units voice coil actuators because they were single pole. Now we, all, we, we make single pole, multi pole, so we really uh, prefer to use the term moving coil actuator. Okay. So it's okay. basically, it's a linear motor where they where there's two types of linear motors, basically. The old technology is moving magnet. You move a magnet and the coils are fixed. And the newer technology is moving coil. Where the magnets are fixed, you move the coil. Okay. And so how is that different from like a, a, a typical actuator that's, uh, that's out there a lot with a, a screw or a belt? Okay, well, these are linear motors, right? So linear motors, the advantage for linear motors is they're much faster. Um, they're much more precise because it's a, it's a direct drive, direct linear drive, and you're not trans, translating a rotary motion to a linear. Okay. And because they're pretty much non-contact, um, the expected life is much, much longer. Interesting. So is this available in, in both uh, like rod style and rodless style? Yeah, there's slides, there's shaft types. On the shaft types, um, we have strict linear, and then we have uh, um, something that we invented, which is called a linear rotary, where we, we're carrying a separate rotary motor, so the, the rod can go back and forth and then rotate independently. That's interesting. So in, in one actuator, you can do both, like, a, say, a Z and a theta, for example. Yes, Z theta, right? Yeah, which is used for, uh, first developed for electronic industry, for electronic assembly. They'll orient uh, a chip or something, and that's, now it's, spread it's used for automatic thread checking for some drilling and tapping and now for capping and other applications in other industries interesting so uh it, it seems like there's there's a lot of advantage here to having the the direct drive um some accuracy advantages speed advantages what kind of applications does it does that lend itself to uh versus a, a standard actuator well as well it's um the advantages are it can it can uh, it lasts a lot longer, so it'll cycle you know hundreds of millions of times. Wow. So if you get wow. if you get your price down, which we have, the company reduces price thirty five percent over the previous price every five years. If you get it down so it's in the you know five hundred dollar range or so, then you can go after uh, pneumatics because you last a lot longer and you don't cost that much more. Um, you can also use it's very good just going straight into a uh, semiconductor or biotech where you're scanning. In that case, you're, down, you're, you're positioning stuff, um, you know, in 100 nanometer, 50 nanometer kind of area. Wow. So, you know, the, the, the fact that you can go fast and you're very precise and you don't, you don't have any, anything wearing but the guiding mechanism is pretty good. So it sounds like generally any application right now where there's, there's a motion there could be some benefits to voice call, whether it's a life cycle, whether it's speed, whether it's accuracy. Yeah, then, then with ours, um, and they're unique, but there's one other thing that's that's uh, different about them. Uh, we can bump into services and uh, use those to program a force. So we can push, pull. Um, I mean, if you got an iPhone, just about everything that's done in that iPhone, manufacturing-wise, is done with us. Uh, we have we have, we have some some new applications where. We're landing and programming forces with uh, way under a gram uh, resolution. Wow. So that's definitely something you can't do with a pneumatic cylinder. You're able to not you just do You can't do it with pneumatic. Work. You can't do it with ball screw. Uh, moving magnet's pretty hard because the masses in a moving magnet, because it's a magnet, are, are much, much uh, larger than ours. Right? Right. So, so um, for precise force control, um, it's pretty good. Interesting. So now you can not just do pressing, uh, pushing, pulling, that type of thing, but you can also do it to the exact force that's required, or or check the force that you did the oh, pressing. You can do, yeah, you can you can do all sorts of things. Like you know, we're we're the standard at Ford for any switch testing, anything that's human interface on in their cars now. 
And what you're doing then is you're bumping into a surface, pressing with forces, and then and then feeding back what's happened. Where's the switch point on the switch? What's the hysteresis loop? So the devices are mechatronic. That means that in, in our case, we can we control all these functions, but we also have feedback, which, so we know what we did and, and was it done correctly or not. Very cool. And so you kind of touched on something back there a little bit. It, is, it seems like there's a lot of advantages. Um, from a disadvantage standpoint, is there any reason somebody wouldn't just use a, a voice coil actuator? Are there applications well, you, that doesn't? Yeah, if you're, um, well, right now we're limited to about 250 millimeters. We're going out to 500, but about 500 millimeters max uh, stroke. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, that... Forces, yeah, the forces, we're up, we go to 650, we'll be moving up to about 1,000 Newton, but uh, that's about as, as far as we're going to go right now. So, I mean, if you want to get into heavier forces um, and you're just applying uh, a heavy force, you know, pneumatics has an advantage. Uh, okay. So, you know, that kind of thing. So there's no perfect solution for anything. Sure, right. And, and you said 1,000 newtons, that's about like 220, somewhere around there, pounds, 225 oh, yeah. in that ballpark. Okay. So, so what's needed to make a, a voice coil system work? Um, is there an actuator drive or, or what all do you need? It's a, it's a, this is a servo motor. You know, ours, okay. act, they're not, they're not, we, they're not brush motors, but they, uh, the brush, they act like, they act like brush or brushless motors, but depending on not whether they're you know, one pole or multiple. Okay. So you need, uh, you need a uh, well, servo controller. Uh, there's an encoder, which we manufacture ourselves. One of these, we can keep the prices down. In the actuator, then you need a power supply with 24 volt, 48 volt DC. Uh, because it's a moving coil, and the masses are like we're low current. You know, where uh, a moving magnet would would run at five to ten amps. So you got to be really careful with it. Yeah. So your safeties are in. But would normally run in the one to 1.5 amp range, right? Cool. Okay. That's well, exactly what it is. Cool. Yeah. Uh, that, that sounds like you. So you've got your controller and and actuator cables. I'm sure connecting, and then power supply in the system, and, and you're off and running. Yeah, and the, and the newest one that we have the our newest ones are out called CBs. Uh, those are round. They look like air cylinders. You know, they're linear motors look like air cylinders. And that one has uh, going into what a really a really small uh, compact uh, controller that uh, just screws onto the back of them. So, oh, nice. And with, with there's a lot of work on GUIs these days to make it easy to use, and one of them is a GUI that makes it easier to set up uh, than an air cylinder, which is uh, pretty good. Nice. So you can and almost drop in this round body in the, the same area you had an air cylinder before. Yeah, that's what's going on built in the back. Yeah, it's going on. At the, you know, the, I grew up in pneumatics at uh, Mac and SMC, and you know. 25% of the air cylinders that are sold every year are just going out to replace ones that failed. You know, the, any high-speed application, which means faster than two hertz, um, that thing's going to break eventually because you can't slow it down. So if you can have something that drops in, that'll last you know, five years, 10 years versus three to six months. And, you know, that's a benefit. Yeah. Less downtime, less replacements. That's great. Yep. There's a, there's a tendency, you know, more and more, you start out with, uh, you know, CNC machining, machining centers all programmable, moved into to electronic assembly, Maddox got kicked out there, everything there is programmable so you can make changes on the fly. Now that's starting to move into automotive and it's moving into packaging. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Okay. And thank you all to, for listening to Brenner Fiedler's This Automation Life. If you have any questions about what you just heard or if you have a topic you'd like to hear discussed, please email us at tech, that's T-E-C-H, at B-R-F-A dot com. And be sure to continue tuning in each week as we come up with more episodes.